So please join me in welcoming to the stage Greg Kesich, Julia Spencer Fleming, and Victoria Vidal Hugo. Hugo Vidal. I knew I was going to mess it up. Have fun. <laughs> Go, Greg. Oh, look, so Thank you. So, you've got a hyphenated last name, you have a hyphenated last name, they don't match. What's, what's the story? <laughs> so, I sometimes get credit for being like really cool and hyphenating my name with my husband's name. Actually, I, I am Julia Spencer Fleming, that's my maiden name. And um, in 1985, I was at a graduate student dance in, at George Washington University. And I met this young guy who was in law school. And he said, I'm Ross Hugo Vidal. And I said, I'm Julia Spencer Fleming. It was like, you're hyphenated. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so that it was, was rare it. in the 80s. Yeah, right. we got lots of suggestions about stringing the whole thing together. Right, like a train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it would have sounded like a law firm with just the two of us. <laughs> right. So socially, and many of you probably know me as this, socially I'm, I'm Julia Hugo Vidal. And legally, let's be clear. And legally, as <laughs> a, but but um, when I first published, when I, when I was getting ready to, to publish the first book, I decided I wanted to have it under my maiden name. And what I used to say was, so that people, you know, it, because it was, it was me. It wasn't me as a mother or wife. It was, you know, me as an individual. But the real reason I did it is because I wanted everybody that I went to high school and college with to know <laughs> that I had published a book. <laughs> hey, do, so, do you remember, I got to say this about the name thing, though. This mm -hmm. one time when we were, um, I don't know, it, it, she was on one of her book tours, and I was maybe 10 or 11, and the person who bought her tickets for her, her plane tickets, booked them under Julia Spencer Fleming, mm. but all of her ID says Hugo Vidal. And so, like, every airport counter, and I, uh, she would have to, like, show her her ID, but then she would, like, show the back of her hardcover book with her face on it and be like, so this is me, and this is also me. Yeah, this is true. So, um, I want to ask you about uh, being a lawyer, uh, because... Uh, you and your late husband, Ross, mm -hmm. were both attorneys here in Portland. Right. And then you both went to go do something else. And you went to go be a best-selling author. Mm -hmm. and, and Ross uh, went to be a um, special ed, uh, ed tech. And uh, could you tell me about that process? Like, how did how did you take that convert leap? convert from lawyer? Yeah, to yeah, to knowledge. you know, and, uh, well, and, and having having you kids know, and <laughs> family at the time. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I did. I did have that. So uh, I, the reason I went to law school is because that I had been working in the nonprofit field and. I wanted to buy a car someday. And I thought, I'm never going to be able to do it on what they're paying me at this museum. Uh, but my, my then boyfriend and later husband was in law school. And uh, I knew him and all his friends. And I thought, if these guys can get through law school, I know I can do it too. <laughs> so um, I went to law school here at the University of Maine, one of the 10 roundest law schools in the nation. <laughs> You, and, you've all seen the building. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know what's happening. The kerosene can. And um, I, right after I got out, um, I, I graduated right during the, the, the recession in 90. The, the um, real estate market had crashed, and I couldn't really find a job. And I was really, really trying very hard to have a baby. How hard? <laughs> it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I just, I just did pickup work, you know, I did, I did like contract work and things. And um, I had actually started writing when I was still a stay-at-home mother. Um, I, Victoria uh, had gotten into kindergarten and our son Spencer... Very exclusive kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, when Victoria started kindergarten um, and uh, Spencer went to preschool for three or four mornings a week. And all of a sudden, after what was then, you know, five years of stay-at-home motherhood, I had three or four mornings a week where I had no children around whatsoever. It was like, oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> so Ross, who had paid my way through law school, said, why don't you get a job? And I was like, yeah, well, that's, maybe, that's a bridge too far right now. So I wound up joining an online writer's group. And I started doing some short stories and some character sketches. And I very quickly realized that 
Um, one, I loved writing fiction. Two, I was really good at it. Um, and three, it just, it fed me in a way. It was much more meaningful than anything else that I had done. But not parenthood, right? But never parenthood, no, it was, no. Okay, Being that was the best. a mother has been the best part of my life. <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay. So, so um, I wrote uh, my first novel in the bleak midwinter and um, finished it. And right, right after I finished it, I had my third child, uh, Victoria's uh, youngest, youngest sibling. Um, so then I had two kids in elementary school and an infant, and I didn't know what the heck to do. And I wound up sending it out to St. Martin's Press as a part of a, a contest. And I won. I beat out 200 other manuscripts and got the prize, which was a contract for publication, hardcover, and softcover. And that was the start of my career. Yeah, the now, there's actually some law practice in there. For about 15 minutes, I was working for the law offices of Joe Bornstein. What a you mean business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> did you know any writers growing up? I mean, how did no. you know? No, it never occurred to me. That I that people actually made a living as a writer, they, you know they don't I usually they, <laughs> okay I have it never occurred jobs. to me that people made a bad living as a writer, um, I, you know I thought writers were the people who were in the back you know the 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 back of the hardcover book and or maybe like in a garret in Paris or something. Uh, so the fact the that, that it could be somebody living in Buxton and knocking <laughs> out novels is, did not strike me as being something realistic. So Victoria, you had a very realistic view of yeah. uh, being uh, what it's like to be a writer, and you decided to do it anyway. Well, I didn't really decide it. Um, I think like most things uh, in my life up to a point it started because I got really drunk one night. Um, yeah, uh, so, oh, by the way, my name is Victoria and I'm an alcoholic. Um, uh, I've been sober for six months, but it started because I had read a, thank you. It's been so proud of you. Well, I just have to say that else, a lot of other things may not make sense. Um, so a couple, you know, I, I'd read one too many articles blaming millennials for the downfall of U US society. Um, and I got really drunk one night and I wrote a letter to the editor uh, of the paper just saying like, you know, this is all the little stuff millennials are putting up with. We have student debt, we're exhausted, our dads all have cancer, we're working three jobs. Um, the cancer part was mostly me. Uh, but I, I actually have no memory of writing this letter. I woke up the next morning, I looked at my phone, it said, you know, thanks for your submission. I thought, oh boy, what'd I do? Um, one of the many reasons I quit drinking. Uh, but anyway, it got a lot of traction on the website and then. I mean, this is actually something I was on the other end of. I, I read the letters to the editor as they come in and I, I tend not to like, you know, give any special favors to my friends. Uh, and I've known, I've known these guys, I should probably say. This is not the first time we've met. No, no his daughter's uh, my best friend. And, um, uh, <laughs> in fact, I think it's um, out here somewhere. But uh, so I was, I was reading this letter and I thought, oh, this is, you know, because you read from the top down and I was like, this is fantastic, this is great, this is great, this is great. And then I was like, hmm, I know this person. <laughs> and I handed it to uh, uh, the, my other editor and said, you know, what do you think of this letter? And we both agreed um, it was terrific. Uh, Sober or not, but all, all the it's other better. Columns. Everything else has been uh, all very the other good columns too. I wrote sober, like my official press herald columns. I've all written sober. Some of the early ones were definitely written while hungover, but they're all sober well, now. So what do you what do you think of that form, the the newspaper column? Uh, how do you like? Was that a you seem unnatural at it? You have a very uh, uh, you have a sense of structure. Uh, <laughs> you, you tell a story. You know, you do all this stuff that. Uh, that a lot of people struggle with? Well, I was an English major, um, and if there's one thing that being an English major in college teaches you, it's how to write short papers, you know, get to yeah. the point of thesis, uh, three paragraph proof, uh, end statement that restates your thesis. Uh, so I think that's kind of part of it, but I also read a lot of newspaper columns. I read like all the, all the Press Herald ones, obviously. I read all the Washington Post ones. So I, I think it's part mimicking that. Uh, who, do you, who do you like? Um, like at our paper, I mean, there's not very many columnists left. I do actually, um, or or I, other columnists, like in, yeah, in the New York well. Times, oh, yeah, yeah, the um, Washington Post. I do love um, I love Dana Milbank and Catherine Rampal, um, Alexandra Petri. You should Petri? all Petri 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 Petri. Petri? Petri? I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but I love her. Um, 
And I really, I usually read Jim Foss's work in the Press Herald. Um, most of the time it makes steam come out of my ears, but like uh, he's actually, you know, an intellectual type person, so I always like reading what he was thinking. That's what he's here for. Is he here? Or he's not actually here. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then, you know, Fight me. The collective, the collective here. Um, <laughs> So we were talking earlier, um, uh, Julia, you know, you talked about um, reading as being the real training yep. for, uh, yeah. for a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And that sounds like what Victoria's talking about. Uh, what did you like to read? What, what are your, you know, what, what genres well, do you I, read? Well, I read space romance. I, space romance? Well, space. You love space romance. I like science fiction. It's not called space romance. It's, <laughs> it's, I do like romance, that. Um, In space. I, you know, grew up reading just about everything. And I still like just about everything except, like, westerns and techno thrillers, <laughs> you know? I, I've never, oh, and Clive Cussler. I've never been I able to get through Clive Cussler. No. Do you remember, so, I love um, it. like, your first favorite book, like the book that you just read till the pages fell out? Um, yes, it was The Marvelous Journey to the Mushroom Planet. I can't even remember the name of the author, but I loved it. If anybody, you know, somebody can like Google it or whatever, but um, I read that when I was a kid. Uh, science fiction, children's science fiction, and it just transported me. Um, it, the interesting thing was is that throughout my life, actually, science fiction has been probably my 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 longest favorite genre. But I can't write it. I actually tried. When I said, you know, I, I was telling you how I got started. I wrote in the bleak midwinter. Well, first I tried to write a science fiction novel. I wrote about 50,000 words, about half of a novel's worth, and I took it to a science fiction conference where they had a, a big, huge writer's workshop, and it was workshopped with uh, writing instructors and uh, professional, you know, uh, published uh, writers and stuff, and, and everybody said the same thing about my, my putative science fiction novel, which was um, the characters were well-rounded and realistic, the prose was was of publishable quality, and my ideas about science fiction were hackneyed, cliched, and unmarketable. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like I was taking it in, but it wasn't turning, it wasn't composting inside me to something that could grow. Um, but what I actually was writing in my first book was, was the story in this is, is um, the heroine, who is a social services professional, finds a dead body in her office, uh, in the in first, space. in the first three, in the first in three space. pages, in space. Yeah, her office is in space. This is true, and it's on a spaceship. And she has to team up with the attractive but distant chief of security <laughs> <laughs> to figure out who done it. And I didn't even read mysteries when I was growing up. So you can just, one thing. Just death just sprouts out of me. So. Space so was replaced by upstate New York. Yes, okay. yeah. Which yeah. is like an Yeah, but the murder world. stayed the same. What about you, Victoria? What was your, your first favorite book? Do you remember? ElfQuest. Um, I in, well, I mean, I read everything. I, like, literally, I would just read the backs of cereal boxes. I mean, my mother can tell you. I, I would read books in class, like in school. <laughs> like, I'd tuck one inside my schoolwork and be reading. And then, like, my teachers would be upset. But, like, they knew they had to encourage the reading, but maybe not in the middle of science. We um, would punish her by taking books away from her <laughs> and say, you can't read. <laughs> it, it, I didn't get punished a lot, obviously. No. <laughs> uh, no, I think one of the first big things I read was ElfQuest, which was a series of graphic novels from the 70s that my mother had had because she was, you know, a nerd. Um, and yeah, they were really good and they, you know, they were graphic novels, which obviously I can't do because I can't draw, but they were elves on a quest and I, they were fun, colorful characters and I used to dress all my Barbies up and make them go on magical quests too. And also all the elves were kind of gay, which probably had some influence on me as well. Um, you know, I think if we do this again, we should, we should come up with better examples. We should come up with like, yeah. Jonathan Safran Foer. I mean, I did and, love uh, Madeline Langle, obviously. All right, there you go. Obviously, you who, go. by the way, went to Smith, uh, like I did. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Wrinkle in Time, which I don't know if any, I'm sure at least some people fear have read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Movie's great, too. Uh, cried at the movie. But yeah, she was definitely a, a fun one. But I think Elfquist was the first big thing. <laughs> and you can blame her. How about now? What are you reading? Um, well, I don't really have time to read right now because I have three jobs, but um, I. You know, I read a lot of um, long-form journalism online. That's stuff I like. I know, right? Um, 
I've been reading a lot of like personal finance columns. Um, I have Stormy Daniels' memoir, which I'm waiting to read when I have like a vacation, maybe someday. Um, yeah, I met her. She's awesome. <laughs> she smells very nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> what about you, Julia? What, what have you been reading these days? Uh, I have not been reading Stormy You're Daniels, writing. and I don't know like if she him? smells nice or not. <laughs> She certainly you seemed like her. very she's, nice. She's like a crazy mm-hmm. horse lady, like, mm-hmm. like your husband yes. was. Um, what am I reading? I, I am very, I'm working very hard to get my, my very, very overdue manuscript finished by the beginning of the year. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and so when I'm, when I'm really, really face down in manuscript, uh, I prefer to read nonfiction. So um, I was reading uh, The Waters Will Rise, which is delightfully scary about how we're all doomed from climate change. Um, Thanks, baby boomers. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. But, um, and uh, what else have I read recently? Do you I'm read, trying to stay away from political Do you books. read newspaper I columns? Do, do, I do. I do read, read newspaper <laughs> columns. I read the main millennial, millennial every... Every week, every and week. And you're ends. a big newspaper reader, I know. I am a big newspaper uh, you reader. You follow I, the crime very, very we, closely. I do, crime, I do read newspapers. I've got, I subscribe to the Portland Press Herald, um, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. So, which I think I are the you three that everyone in America mine. should probably do, you know? Uh, right. Exactly. <laughs> very good. That's a good point. So, um, you both are, you know, obviously very different uh, disciplines, genres, mm-hmm. but... Um, uh, I was going to say, we're like the No, you're very much, you're like twins in, in real <laughs> life. But, uh, yeah, uh, Genetically, you're very close, but uh, you do a different, very different kind of work. But uh, could you talk a little bit about um, where your ideas come from? You're both original thinkers. Um, uh, do they That's come to you uh, uh, all at once, or, or do you develop them? Uh, how do you recognize a good idea for, for you know, what you do? That's interesting because I we run both it past to, my editor. We have to come up with yeah, but you have to come up with the ideas. How I, do you come up? I mean, I know how I come up with my ideas. How do you come up with yours? I, usually, I mean, most of the time it's just something that bothers me, and then it's um, like I'll be thinking about whatever, and then a, it'll like being it's like a song getting stuck in my head. I'll just kind of start percolating on one topic, and then I'll start like usually when I'm in the shower or driving. Those are like when I do my best thinking, um, and then. You know, I'll just start thinking, and then sentences, I'll get a few sentences stuck in my head, and then I'll just be writing paragraphs in my head, and then I'll go to a keyboard and pound it out and run it past him. Usually he says it's okay, sometimes not. But, yeah, usually it's whatever I'm upset about. Um, (laughs) Or, you know, feeling inspired by or, or upset. Yeah. So so it starts with like an irritation and then pretty much yeah, it's like and I, I yeah. can't and then it, it won't go away until I write it all. Yes, just like pearls. <laughs> yes, it's I'm, an, irritation. I'm an oyster. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah. You know, Professional writers. Man, well it's like and it's yeah. that won't go away until I write about it. I definitely have some columns tucked away that I just had to get out of me that I can't publish, but do you have like a reader in mind? Yeah, um, but, but a specific. Yeah, I yeah. mean, in my, uh, anyone who's reading the paper, um, I was originally hired, you know, to be the, the fun millennial voice, I assume, to connect to the sort of, uh, I think the newspaper subscription crowd tends to be a little older than the millennial generation, to put it correctly. Yes. Um, and I was supposed to be the fun millennial voice. And then it kind of turned into like the dead dad alcoholism column. <laughs> right. uh, I'll but try fun. to be fun but again. But fun, yeah, yeah. Fun dead dad alcoholism yeah, yeah. column. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, but yeah, I would say it's uh, just trying to explain the youth culture to all of Maine. What about you, Julia? Do you, do you have like a... <laughs> I don't know the how youth do you, culture. I no, can't no, how explain do you, it. <laughs> I, write, I write from my mother. <laughs> how do you uh, know a good idea? Wait, how do I know a good idea? I used to tell people that I went to Walmart to the idea aisle and I picked uh, things up there. Now, um, um, I used to write ideas down and then I converted to Stephen King who says that the good ideas stick with a, a writer. The, an idea that's good enough to carry a whole novel, if it, you can't, you don't get rid of. You don't have to write it down because you don't get rid of it. Here's the thing, and I will tell you, everybody who is in the audience, you will know that you are a fiction writer if you are constantly getting story ideas. It's this close to mental illness, honestly. <laughs> I used to worry because before I started writing because I would just see something and I would automatically start spinning a story about it in my head. It's like having a hamster wheel in your yeah, brain. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, it, it's an imaginative gift that some of us have, and you simply, 
you don't turn it off. People love Sometimes people will come up and they'll say, oh, you know, here, I've got an idea that I would like to share with you. And I would say, you know what, I have more ideas than I will ever, ever be able to get to writing for a novel. It just, they just bubble up constantly. Does it uh, start with a line of dialogue or an image? Usually an image for Sexy me. Sexy cop? Yes. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they usually start with images for me. And then, I mean, I'll, like I said, you know, I'll see something and it registers. And um, I mean, the Miller's Kill story started because I lived in the area that I write about. And it always struck me as this, it's very old. It's, it's one of the older settled parts of the United States. But it was also the frontier when, you know, when people were living here in the Maine. Uh, the Adirondacks were the, the Wild West, and um, it's still this very rugged and dangerous place. And I just sort of had this, this geography of it that I carried around in my head that I found very compelling. So Bleak compelling, and I started to write about it. Bleak. Like Russ Van Alstyne's heart. That's, yeah. no, he's a nice, warm, well, when he study bear stuff. Well, yeah, he is bleak, and I said. So, so that's, yeah, they come from images mostly. And does it help that it's um, something from your past and not? You're present? Yeah, but I can be inspired by, you know, things that are in my present. I can be inspired by people that I meet, and I start thinking, oh, this, this person's story would be interesting, you know, if I just started twisting it like that. And here's the thing. The, I believe the genre chooses the author and not otherwise. The you, wand chooses Vic, its wizard Vic, Yes. Victoria has <laughs> written some other stuff. Um, and some fiction, um, and you know, I tried writing science fiction. I've written some other things, but every idea that I come up with always turns into a murder. Somebody's going to get killed. That's a little unnerving. <laughs> you want to tell the story about the time that you guys came home? Oh, and I was cleaning up stuff. Oh, the from blood. The yeah. <laughs> well, like we just got home from school one day, and like my mom was literally on her hands and knees scrubbing blood off the kitchen floor, like sticky, wet blood. My dad just got real nervous, like, oh, what you doing, hon? Mom's like, oh, you know, just some research. And we're like, okay, hon. Yes, dear. Actually, I had, I had nuked a cut of beef in the microwave, and it had all this juice. And when I took it out, it spilled on the floor. Or so did it. Was, <laughs> that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um. Do you have uh, any kind of rituals, any habits around writing? Do you have to be in a certain place? Do you need, do you need everything to be quiet? Uh, do, you, you know, do you need a little distraction? You take well, that? I grew up with you know, siblings, and so I work best with a low level of noise in the background. I do need coffee, which reminds me, I just wanted to say real quick thank you to Peggy uh, for <laughs> buying me this cup of coffee because I forgot my debit card on my other uh, pants like an idiot. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, anyway, no, I mostly write. Uh, I write in a Google, um, in a Gmail email form document. I don't know why. That's my draft. It's where I like to do it. I can access it from any computer. I'll just open up an email and start writing and save mm -hmm. it as a draft. That makes sense. Which, you know, I, I didn't think it was weird. And then my boyfriend saw me doing it and was like, why are you doing that? And I was like, I don't know. It just feels right. Uh, I usually do it um, at work uh, at, at my is anyone don't, from? Uh, don't, don't I would. <laughs> I do it. Ixnay in, on the earth um, way. <laughs> um, my brain's always working. Yeah. I write it in a Gmail document whenever the fancy strikes me. How about you, Well Julia? caffeinated. Do you have any? Uh, well, my places? preferred method is to start writing a book and then take five years to finish it. <laughs> she works best at her, age, at her book agent's fancy summer house in Nantucket. Yeah, I, I've gotten some good work done there. You know, um, yeah, I needed to be quiet. I might have some classical music or jazz playing in the background. I have to, the biggest challenge for me when I had kids at home was um, turning off the mom portion to be a writer. Uh, being a good writer is the antithesis of being a good mother, because when you're right for fiction... But you're always my you're, mother. Uh, yes, I'm always your mother, dear. <laughs> um, so, you know, being a good mother is always being there, being open and accessible and available. And being a good writer, or really artist, I should say, because I have friends who are artists, um, is turning that off and saying no. 
the work is important and focusing on that is important and letting everything else go to hell in a handbasket. Um, Which I did. That's difficult to balance. Um, but now I'm an empty nester and I'm actually really enjoying it. <laughs> I'm Except so I miss happy. you, honey. You miss me so much. So much. Oh, so much. This is so lovely. <laughs> is that? Yeah, I guess I hear that that's a um, a bigger challenge for women um, to be able to close out the world when they have a family. Like, yes, Greg. Sort of, I think it is a bigger I challenge think I hear. for women. <laughs> Let's see. Is your wife in here? Let's see what I she. I believe thinks. she is. <laughs> but, uh, all right, so here, this is kind of a weird question. Um, when you're done writing something, how do you feel? Do you feel, are you energized? Do you, do you want to go out and celebrate? Or um, do you want to, do you walk into walls? Are you like, you know, exhausted? Wait, does it take out of you or does it? Does it That's uh, interesting, because we're both, I mean, it literally takes me the very- You would be extroverts, The very right? fastest that I've ever finished a book has been within like one year. So for all me, all of her children were overdue as well. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Um, all of us were born after the due not date. Not that overdue, but hey, Ginger but, was three weeks. Yeah, no, no, she was fourteen days. They only let you go for about 12, 12 to fourteen days, and then they do slavery. Um, <laughs> Sorry, good this, to know. <laughs> this we're learning so much. Brought to you by <laughs> by Fun educating facts. your children. Um, so for me, you know. It's topping off a year or two years or more worth of work. So I feel great. I usually finish my books in this enormous, getting back to the birth metaphor, push where I will write an insane amount of words for me. I'll write like five or six or 8,000 words in one sitting and finally get to, to the end. It all has to be rewritten later on because it's, you know, it's this big hurried rush. But I get there and then I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And I feel great. Um, you do it every week, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't have time to celebrate. I got stuff to do. Like, uh -huh. uh, it's you know, it's it's scratching the itch and then like sending it off into the ether and then like I have to wait a couple days for it to be published. I have to wait a couple days to be like, all right, what are people gonna say? What are they gonna think about this one? Like, mm -hmm. how are they gonna react? Mm -hmm. uh, usually, it's pretty good. So, uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? What kind of reaction have you been getting uh, to the column? Well, mostly positive. I was a little, I mean, I honestly thought at first I'd be getting way more hate mail because I've been listening to Greg talk about his like hate mail for years. Like, I don't know about you, he, I got a lot of hate mail. <laughs> yeah, he like, growing up, like the fun activity is like, let's listen to the angry messages left on Greg's <laughs> answering machine. Or like, you son of a bitch, you're ruining me. Um, yeah, but, and so I figured I was like, I'm a, a little. I hope that person isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he would pay to see you. Yeah, yeah. I think it would pay to not see you. Um, <laughs> let's all laugh at Greg. Uh, you know, it's not surprising she writes for the newspaper. What's surprising is it took her 26 years to get to that point, really. <laughs> well, Dad had to make a deathbed promise and everything. That's true. Uh, That's true. There was a deathbed promise involved. Anyway, uh, no, I, it's been a very positive reaction. I was a little worried that I'd be like a crazy controversial young person and then I think I just remind everyone even the really conservative people like of their grandchild because I get a lot of readers emails like you know I normally don't like the liberal garbage press herald but I like your <laughs> column like I do and I'm like well I'm also liberal garbage sir but thank you um and you know it's, it's been much a pretty good reaction I've only got like a few emails wishing I was dead so yeah. I mean the, the sort of the nature of the column is you're talking about yourself um, and, and so people have to look at you as a person and uh, you're not like telling them something uh, that they maybe, maybe don't want to hear. Uh, you, people writing the same, Probably have. you know, delivering sort of the same message um, uh, get a much different, you know, argumentative reaction well, when I, I you're not telling your own way. story. You, you're funny. You know, they yes. like that and I'm also, mm -hmm. think it helps that I'm like uh, a young woman. So they feel, maybe they all hate me, but they don't want to yell at me like they do Greg because it just seems wrong. No, they, they yell at the women too. Oh, I guess. Not <laughs> right, right. You're doing, you're I doing guess a good job. You're connecting with readers. They like me. That, they really uh, like me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's a Sally Fields reference. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah you're I cool. Did that. You're cool. So you mentioned this um, earlier about, you know, writing about recovery and alcoholism. Um, do How did you decide to, to write it? I mean, is there a, 
Is there something that, is any part of you like off the record? Is everything um, uh, up for uh, writing in your column? Well, I don't want to write too much about my boyfriend because I think he'll get pissed. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, other, he's really great. I love him so he's much. He's very nice. I love him so much. He doesn't. He doesn't read my columns because he's worried he's gonna. It, he'll argue with me about them because <laughs> he he kind of has to play devil's advocate on everything, which is like great for intellectual arguments, but bad for like when I just want him to praise my talent and work. Um, but no, I, I mainly started writing about the recovery thing uh, for two reasons. One is a big one was just. Um, to, for accountability, I figured if people in the greater Portland area are reading that I'm a recovering alcoholic, they won't, like, if I crack and, like, try to order a drink at a bar, they, they might recognize me and say no. Um, so if you work somewhere that sells alcohol, don't give it to me. Um, bad, don't do it. Uh, and then the other was because I know I have, um, I don't really fit most people's stereotypes of an alcoholic. Uh, being a young, uneducated uneduc woman, fairly, I have a master's degree. Um, and so with the with that and the platform that I have, I felt kind of a responsibility to write about it um, so that, you know, because once you start breaking down stereotypes, people start looking more of it as individuals. Um, a lot of times addiction is seen, you know, as a moral failing or a lack of control. Um, and so if I can explain sort of what's going on from the other side of, of the, the glass, um, literally, the full glass uh, of alcohol. Um, <laughs> if I can, you know, get that across, I think it'll make the world easier for other mm -hmm. uh, people who may have drinking problems. And what? Oh, 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 oh. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> you know, I, normally I'm really bad at like, you know, taking taking praise about things. So I'm like, oh no, I just do that. But you know what? Being sober is really, really hard. So I will take that <laughs> praise. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> Like, there's, there was rum, apple cider over there, and I wanted some so bad, but I did not have any. Uh, and what kind of reaction have you been getting to those columns? Really good. Um, really good ones, which is, which is nice. I've had a lot of people write to me saying, you know, like, I've been sober for X amount of years, or I know someone who has. Um, I got an email actually earlier today about someone who was like, my friend just got out of a 30-day rehab stint, but he, he still thinks he can, you know, control his drinking. And I'm like... Uh, tell your friend to write to me. He's, uh, this big, big, big step is accepting the fact that you can't, you know, drink moderately if you're an alcoholic. Um, but mostly, it's been pretty positive, uh, which I appreciate. Um, except for that one guy who wrote the letter to the editor on Sunday that said, uh, "Addiction isn't a disease; stupidity is a disease, and we should cure that." <laughs> and it's stupid to be addicted to stuff. And I was like, I mean, it, it is, but <laughs> it kind of happens sometimes. Right, and everybody's looking for the cure to that one. Yeah. And, yeah, like I would like to give my brother a stupidity cure, but. So what do you think, Julia? When, uh, do you, when, I think her when brother needs a stupidity cure. Too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He's a wonderful guy. He's in the he Navy. He is. He's in the Navy. He's a wonderful kid, but. Um, do you wish she was? A... <laughs> <laughs> She's got three kids. You know, one of them has to be kind of a dud. Right, right. Yes, Greg, what is your question? Uh, my I'm question sure is, as a mother, do you yeah. wish your daughter <laughs> was not mother. so frank? As a mother, you do you know, wish I wasn't an alcoholic? About her personal life. <laughs> do I wish that she was less frank? Well, so, so far in the column, Victoria has referred to me as fat, <laughs> poor. The, the word I used was battle axe? Battle axe. That was the third one. I was getting to battle axe. I love battle axe. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> and I think it was the, the battle axe. Here's... Here's the thing. I think that Victoria is utterly fearless as a writer in a way that I, I could not be. I hide things behind fiction. You know, I put parts of myself into every character that I write. But I'm not telling you all about me and my life, and I don't want to share me I and will. my life with you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, I'll tell you about her life. <laughs> that is, it's, yeah. And, and I find that incredibly admirable as a writer. You know, I find it really, it, it's very brave and... You're just like flying out there on a high wire without a net, and there aren't a lot of people who are willing to do that. We there was actually a moment. I think it was the battle axe column. <laughs> I, where for the record, I love the phrase you, battle axe. I you, think it should be a compliment. Where you showed it to me mm -hmm. and said, "Mom, how would you feel? You know, can I can I put this in?" And you know, I wasn't <laughs> wild about the idea about all of you know Maine hearing me call the battle axe, it's but. A Yes, yes, yeah, just like your father who said, you're weathered like an old barn. That was meant to be a compliment, too. 
<laughs> I got my talent from him. God love you, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, 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 I looked at this column where I was described as a battle and I thought, I knew that if I said anything, that you would take it out. Well, yeah. Right. I'm not a jerk. But I knew that if I said anything, then there was always going to be a censor sitting there talking to Victoria saying, you maybe you better not do that. You, that might bother somebody. That might do that. Well, mostly I care about bothering you. Right. And I don't want you to care about bothering me. I want you to get out there and just do it and be as utterly honest and fearless as you can because that's your gift. That's, that's what makes you, your writing powerful. I was always just told that, you know, I, I've always been a bit of an overshare, you know, TMI is the word. Uh, yeah. my, my family knows this. My boyfriend is very long suffering. Um, but now I like get paid to do it, so it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, uh, before, right before your first column ran. Um, the Tinder one. Yes, and it was about dating, and you have a boyfriend <laughs> and a girlfriend, and like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I, I, I said, you know, you may get a very negative reaction from some people. Some people are really going to like this, but other people are, and, and you I know, they not. may say some, uh, some cruel things. And uh, you gave me this look like, oh, you're an idiot. And, uh, <laughs> and you said, I don't care what people say about me online. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> You are a millennial. <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up. Because I do. I go, you know, I go home and, well, like, you know. But you have to also think about where, how she grew up. Yeah. You well, it, it, you know, but you're, you're right. She's we, fearless. We, we make sarcasm and, you know, abuse is sort of like a, a, a gentle family sport in ours. Not like physical abuse. We don't get, but, but there's a lot of teasing yeah. that goes on in our family. Not to mention there's, like, nothing anyone else could say about me that I haven't, like, already said to myself about myself. So... Like, what are they gonna do? Yeah. Call me an alcoholic? Like, <laughs> fine, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> like, I don't care. I mean, well, but the reaction is pretty good. Because you're perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, fight me. I'll fight anyone. I think we're not ready for uh, audience questions like, yet. Say so you're not ready for We're me. not ready for yeah, questions not, yet? Well, we are. The world is I not thought ready we for would. me. I feel ready. I feel... Do you want more questions? Moment. No, I feel ready for the audience questions. Okay. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're okay, so ready. we can take questions from the audience. Now, uh, please wait for Molly to get to you with the microphone. I fear. Ooh, the lights come up. Question for Victoria. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned um, that your dad had a, a deathbed promise. I mean, is that something that you that you're prepared to talk about, or or not? If oh, you're not, yeah, that's I mean, fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, th between um, the time when I wrote the letter to the editor that got published and got a lot of traction, I know that Greg had been thinking about inviting me like on board to, to write stuff, um, at least on a trial base, to see if I could be a good columnist. And then when my dad was dying, you know, lots of people were visiting him in the hospice, including Greg being an old friend, and I don't know what exactly was said between them, but I know my dad very much believed in me and my talent, and what uh, I guess he figured it, he'd use his one last bit of leverage to get Greg to give me a <laughs> shot, because like, how are you going to say no to your dying friend? <laughs> so and then I got offered a, a columnist gig a couple days after the funeral. I, I was there for much of this story, so I can tell you, it was not exactly like that. <laughs> well, um, that was what I was imagining. I, I guess the, the best... Um, uh, explanation for this was uh, from one of my daughters. Um, uh, Victoria, I mean, uh, yeah, Victoria asked Lydia Rose if um, uh, this was a, uh, a deathbed promise that I made. That's why she was getting the column. And my daughter said, no, he already was going to give you the column, <laughs> but that's what it takes to get him to move. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, um, no. One last great guilt trip. <laughs> Do you keep hearing a bell jingling? Um, hi. Um, I actually don't have a question, but can I share something with Victoria? Yes, please. Um, my, I love your column. I read it every Sunday. It is so awesome. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> part, mostly I love your writing. It's amazing. But I have to just share with you that I have a 26-year-old daughter living in Portland who is in sobriety. She was pansexual, you know what that is, pansexual? Oh yes, is she single? Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> no. Pansexual is you fall in love with the personality, not the body. Mostly she was attracted to women. But the exact week that you wrote about moving out of your house and into the, your apartment, she moved out of our house and into her first apartment with her boyfriend. Is and your daughter so, me? Like, I'm <laughs> freaking out, I'm gonna, you know? Is this a mirror? It's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, like, is... it's really scary. But I just wanted to say, you've really hit it, you know, with me and my family on the, the, yeah. head, the nail on the head. <laughs> Thanks. I, did, I didn't know my experience was that. I mean, I, I try to ha be a universal experience. I didn't know that I was that specific uh, as well, but <laughs> congratulations. I, I would like to. Um, and congratulations on her sobriety. It is very, very tough, especially when you're young, because like when you're young, everything's like all the ads are for alcohol and clubbing and going out to bars and sucks when you don't do that. You're gonna cry a little bit. No, I was oh, just sorry, you, you didn't go clubbing. Your idea of a fun <laughs> time when you were in college was to sit around with your girlfriends and read from bad romance novels to each other. They were amazing romance. I mean, this you did have drinks while you were doing it, but but okay. Anyway, is there anybody else? Uh, um, I have emailed to Victoria two or three times and she's asked me if I would bring up horses because her grandfather, Victoria Hu Victor Hugo Vidal, was a very, very famous horseman in the 60s and 70s. And I said, are you related to Victor Hugo Vidal? <laughs> and she said yes, and we've corresponded. You're the one from Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, and she told me about her experience with horses, which <laughs> she has to tell you about now because it's a riot. And her grandfather's spinning in his grave. Yeah. But, but, um, and I, I have a millennial child uh, son, and I love your columns. So, But I did recognize the name more as a horse background yes. than as a writer. And, but tell them a story about the mayor. Well, all right, so A, yeah, it's a pretty recognizable name. Um, and it, it's like a very specific, you know, type of celebrity. But um, that's true, and I want to pet your horses. Um, I was actually thinking about writing a column about that this week because a lot of my horse experiences happened at Peaks Island Horse Camp, which the paper just did a story about, like, yeah, about, I, I haven't had time to read it yet, but I guess the zoning board is being a jerk. Um, and I love that horse camp, and I'm going to, fight someone about it. Anyway, no, when I was about three years old, I'm sure you remember this, um, we had neighbors next door who used our backfield to graze their horses in, and my grandfather was a big horse guy, and my dad was too, and so they brought like three-year-old Victoria out to look at the pretty horses, and they took their eye off me for like one second, and there was this really grumpy pregnant mare, her name was Foxy, I think, and she literally picked me up by the shoulder and like shook me like a she, rag doll. She was wearing a very I was heavy jacket, obviously. So it wasn't the bike I was. Flinch. It's me, heavy yes. jacket. I, I was not physically harmed by this incident. <laughs> I, they just, you know, horse picked me up and shook me and threw me. And I, things have not improved with horses since. I've like got one, had one stepped on my hand once. Uh, I fell off them a lot. I'm not a horse person, but I love them. They don't love me. I'm not getting you a horse, Victoria. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not getting a horse. I want a horse for Christmas. <laughs> we have time for one more? Oh. Two or three. Yeah, okay. Oh, good. Talk to me. Oh, and we've got one down here. Too. Right here. Okay. Yeah, Julia, uh, I was always concerned that, that the series had stopped, and now you're saying you've got one coming. Yeah. So, well, you know, I. How did Well, I. I first Her off. My husband it, died. Yeah, my husband died. That's kind of that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I was. Um, Working on the book, my last book came out in 2013, and I figured the next one would come out in 2015. And in December 2015, Victoria's brother, Spencer, um, dropped out of college and came home to live and had some crises and some traumas. And I was dealing with all that and driving him and his sister around when they didn't have licenses but did have jobs. And so mothering, motherhood just sucked up a huge amount of my time for about a year. Um, and I got very little writing done. And then I had a couple of months after Spencer went off to the Navy and everything was going really well. He's and good now. then my husband started showing symptoms of a disease that we didn't know what it was. And Ross was ill for, increasingly ill 
for almost a year and required a lot of help and my attention. And so I spent a year, I'm very grateful that I have this sort of job where I could just say, you know, I'm just going to be here for my husband. Um, and he passed away. On, on my birthday. On her birthday. On, on my 25th birthday. birthday. <laughs> uh, last year, or last in, in, in uh, yes, yeah, September 17th. So September 12th. 2017. September 12th, 17 is the oh, year. I, you, I thought you said 17. Now I know when your birthday Do is. <laughs> Do you? We she thought we had dodged a bullet after 9-11. You know, I'm like, oh, thank God, Victoria wasn't born on, you know, she's born on 9-12. Well, of all then. <laughs> I didn't really have any daddy issues till yeah. that happened. Like, he was a great dad, and then he died on my birthday, and now I have a dad. That one, one issue. <laughs> Question back here. Yeah, hi, hi um, I'm Carson Lutz, and uh, hi, hi Greg. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm so. I want you to know, Victoria, that I've been so touched with some of the things you've written, and you dare to write about things um, taboo subjects like menstruation <laughs> and pe peculiar <laughs> relationships and stuff. But I want to know. I had a very volatile relationship with my mother, and she inspired me in very, um, well, interesting ways. And I wondered how your relationship has developed and how you were inspired or not by your mother. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. she definitely didn't. <laughs> it's so volatile. Uh, no. Um, well, she definitely inspired me to not do writing full time as a career, because um, I'd like to have health insurance and like a paycheck uh, on a regular basis. But um, I mean, obviously, my relationship with my mother is very good, um, which is not good for like dramatic memoirs, I guess, but is good for everyday life. My mom is literally the best mom ever. Um, in case no one knew that, it's true. I'm not just saying this because she's right next to me. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's it's wonderful to see her just be such an awesome badass person. I mean, th this one day, like last year, I, I saw her looking, like doing her makeup in the bathroom mirror, and this is the fat face comment. Um, and she just goes in the mirror and she goes, I love my cute fat face. And she didn't know I was watching, and I just saw that. I was like, I love her, and I love how confident you are. Her face isn't, it's not fat, it's just crap. Sorry, off track. I see, this is one of those things that probably I myself would not share with everybody. <laughs> you said yourself, I could share anything. Well, we're not gonna top that. Uh. But no, my mother is obviously just, I mean, she's been through, I mean, just this past year alone, she's been through, you know, her, her husband died and her mom died and her dog died all like within the same year. And then her daughter was an alcoholic. Uh, so obviously she had, you know, she was dealing with some stuff, and she's still. <laughs> oh, mother! Back to the old country. Um, and she still comes out on top and laughing, and right. still writes. So I just think that's very inspirational. Anyway, well, you guys uh, could keep going for a long time. Mother, but um, I love my mom. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Oh, what, can we just oh, give one more? What, she was raising her hand earlier. Do we have, okay, do we have time for one more? Questions. Two more? Oh, okay. They're going to kick us out? What are they going to do? I don't know. Uh, they gave me a card. I was supposed to say thank you. I will oh, shut yeah. this place down. Yes. Hi. Um, hang on, Victoria. I just want to say that I know for certain Victoria was born with uh, excellent observation skills and no filter. I was going to say Dave, Uncle Dave, <laughs> hi. <laughs> but uh, Julia, I want to ask you, you, I heard you mentioned upstate New York. Can you tell us a little bit more about your motivation for all of your <laughs> colorful characters? This is my uncle. This is, this is my cousin Dave. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we grew up, David and I both grew up in um, Washington County area of uh, upstate New York, which is this very beautiful place that, that now particularly has a lot in common with Maine. Is I say area. like Washington County, Maine. Yeah, well, maybe not as much heroin in Washington County, New York, but um, it's, you know, it, it's a place that has run on uh, natural industries and mills that are all gone now. And it's, it's got tourism in place, and tourism does not pay the kind of money that, that factory jobs did. So uh, it's been interesting to sort of have those two 
connections going on in my life. So living here, I feel I can write very realistically about it. But I love that, you know, I love that place. And um, it's, small towns are endlessly interesting to me. And the great thing about living in Maine is that everything's a small town. Portland's a small town. You know, you cannot get away from your neighbors and the people that you know. You run into your exes everywhere. Yeah, even when you don't, everywhere. even when you, you, you want to avoid them, you can't. So, you know, it's, it's a fertile field for, for writing. And this lady was very patiently waiting. Yes. Can she yeah. get hers? Yes, last question. Okay, <laughs> better be good. The pressure's on. <laughs> Victoria, Hi. I'm Lois, and I'd like to give you a hug. You're my new grandmother. Hi. I meant to say hello. No, no, I got this. Wait. Oh. Hi, Lois. That's so nice to meet you. Oh. I'm so happy to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> my grandmother, who passed away uh, suddenly this, this summer, as I wrote about, was also named Lois. And then all of a sudden, I keep keeping these nice emails from this lady named Lois, and I decided she was going to be my new grandmother. So okay. sorry about that, everyone. So, that's, so, that's so great. Mom, I adopted her. You, usually, I always say, if you didn't have a question, when you know, please come up while I'm signing and ask me questions. Yeah. But I think that Victoria's not signing, so I think Victoria should just stand and give people hugs. Right. So we can have like, you can come up and talk to me and get a book signed, or my, you can hug Victoria. Should have brought my magazine. I think that would be good. Yeah. So my little card says, "Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you, Julia, and thank you, Victoria. This has really been entertaining." Uh, Julia will be uh, signing books up uh, stage uh, left, stage. off the stage. stage. On stage, um, stage. Uh, with help from uh, uh, Longfellow Books. Uh -huh. And um, stick around. It'll take about five minutes to set up. And I guess, Victoria, you're going to be over here. Uh, hugging people. Hugging Apparently. people. <laughs> your fans. But you have, to, and, uh, you have to agree to be my new grandmother or grandfather. <laughs> um, and thanks for everybody for coming. <laughs>